Um, so we've got a printout of hash FMQs which is covering First Minister's questions from Holyrood on the 2nd of June 2011. And uh, if you're not familiar with the hashtag, I suggest you Google it. So we've got things like, just before uh, First Minister's questions begins, a guy called John Nicholl says, To ask the First Minister if he's coming to my leaving do, as I need numbers for the buffet. <laughs> That'll be because Mr. Salmond, and that's the last time I'll call him Mr., is uh, famous for being a bit of a, a garret. I wonder if they'll have a, a curry buffet. Curry buffet. Pop it on in. Okay, well, what, one, of the, one of the things that was interesting of today's first minister question is that um, Ian Gray was quite relaxed for a change, as compared to his uh, performances during the election. Apart from the tick, I noticed that tick today for the first time. Didn't you know he had the tick before? Well, it just continually seemed to hold it off till the end of his statement and then wink at Alex Salmon. It was <laughs> like they were in collusion in some way or other. Well, anyway, he was obviously a bit excited because he forgot the formality. And just like Prime Minister's questions, the formality is that the first question is, what are you doing today, Prime Minister? Or who, when, who are you meeting today? It's a... He completely forgot about it, and as, um, what does F.R. McKenzie mean? Doesn't matter. Is that Father McKenzie? He says, what are you up, are they doing away with all that? What are you up to for the rest of the day, malarkey? So he did forget it. Um, now, can you remember what Ian Gray said when he thought he, he muttered something about being on daytime television again? I think he, he made, he, he made a funny about, um, thinking himself fortunate to be back on daytime television, i.e. He, he scraped in by the skin of his teeth. Yes, he nearly didn't get um, re-elected. I think he did. Actually, it was quite funny at that. That all came from having time to watch television. I, don't, I have no idea what the, the I root think of that was. was a reference to something that he referred to, he'd been chatting with Animal Goldie and Alex Salmond this week, and Alex Salmond had said, he, this is the first time he'd had a chance to watch television since the start of the election. Ah, right. And that was right. a pick-up point. Anyway, uh, the people on Twitter were calling him a, a daytime TV star. I can't see it. Um, can't see it. John Nicholl c comes back with another funny, uh, as apparently he says, uh, Ian Gray, he's going to put the sparkly suit back in the closet. Now he's no longer a daytime TV star. He was never a star. He was actually, I mean, your point about him, he seemed much more relaxed. The pressure seemed off him. That's what I thought. You know, um, and he made some good points. But again, he, he seemed, the Labour Party seems to have taken a decision that they're going to be part of the Parliament, that they're going to drop the aggressive stance. That was what I got out of today. Much more about, we will help you take it forward. You know, with the rider, the, the usual rider, we're in opposition, so we have to test um, the party of government. But it was much more about getting forward, getting agreement, which, from the point of view of the way I always believed the parliament was intended to work, is, is a good thing. You know, if you can, uh, if you can get people sitting down looking for solutions for Scotland as opposed to dogmatic solutions that, you know, follow the party line. I believe you uh, you listened to the economy debate today. In an energy debate. Energy, was it? Uh, which ran from about half past nine this morning, so it was on for a couple of hours. Um, it was interesting, with reference to what you were just saying about, what, I don't know what you call it, cooperation, confrontation in the Parliament. John Swinney was summed up on that debate, and the point he made was that uh, he was pleased that the Lib Dems and the Labour Party seemed to be on side with the SNP government's approach to renewables, which was the, the key topic of any energy debate at the moment. That, I mean, that ties in so much with the economy, because that seems to be where they're placing all their hopes for the new jobs and to quote Salmon, the industrialisation. Reindustrialisation. Um, of Scotland. Well, that actually fits. You know, there has been, I was, uh, it is true that the facts, the figures, economic figures show that across the UK, 
over the last 10 years, um, manufacturing has expanded for the first time in 30 years. Well, so, I mean, certainly the, the infrastructure, old though it is, I mean, the big sheds at Neg, even Leith Docks with Pelmas and their wave well, they're in, technology. They, they moved into the, the big shed that was Peebles. Peebles, that's right, yeah. The yeah, Peebles, there and there. they made um, huge transformers out of Yeah, and in fact, I don't know if they still have, but they had a sort of three-section bit of kit in the dock itself floating, which I presume they used to show prospective clients what exactly they're buying. But that, I mean, that side's really very interesting because it will cover everything. But well, look at this week's announcement by, yesterday's announcement by Angela Mer Merkel. She's over in Singapore and she makes the point, forget the politics in Germany, but they, they are phasing out nuclear power. Yeah. But and they're their going... options, the German options, but are severely limited. They've got very little coastline. Yeah, but they're talking about importing. Well, exactly. Nuclear energy from France. They're not. So it's they NIMBY, prefer, not they, in my back. Yeah, yeah, they'd prefer not to. There'll be a big row about that. Oh, huge. huge. But it's a huge opportunity for Scotland in particular. They really. They're, they're, you can see the Germans financing a North Sea grid, financing a new renewables investment in Scotland. Oh, I think so. I mean, uh, German electricity companies wanting to do so. The, the potential, well, I mean, our, most of our power now is yeah, easy Spanish out, owned. French, you've got... And French. Even and drones, drones. Some German Scottish as well in there, isn't there? Yeah, yeah. But, I mean, it's, ab it's about jobs. Um, if we get the jobs, you know, there's there, our cousins below the border will not be happy if they see us booming along quite happily. Uh, which is not a good thing, because... We don't want the animosity. Well, that is another issue, perhaps for another... How were the, the new kids on the block then? How did they perform today? None of them were uh, asked to speak. There was... Uh, the, two, the two main topics, which predictably, were care homes and the, the UK Supreme Court. And the planted question... I think from an SNP backbencher, I think it was Nigel Dawn. I think he was uh, yeah. about, uh, I think it was a little bit UK, the Supreme Court. Let me just check that. Oops. ND, Nigel Dawn. So, I mean, Alex Salmond was ex obviously was expecting to be asked about the Supreme Court's issue and the care homes, and he, he'd have been well briefed. It's, it's a funny one because the solid, <coughs> excuse me, the solid ground's quite complicated and it's going to be easy for the unionists to argue that it's just because the Supreme Court sits in London. Whereas what was quite interesting, which I didn't know until the debate today, was that it's not our Court of Appeal that decides a case can go on to the Supreme Court, which is the case in England. Yes, an English, um, under the English the jurisdiction, the UK Supreme Court cannot take on a human rights case without it being referred by the, From the, the superior the, the court English appeal. court. Whereas in Scotland, the, they can pick and choose. From and so that's why I think that's why Simon called Lord Hope of the Supreme Court an ambulance chaser because to just he he could there's two Scottish judges sitting there in London to justify their existence. They probably need a set a certain number of Scottish cases. And that's kind of a, just you could argue that it, to just that to justify their existence and their pay for sitting in this court in Westminster in Scottish cases just well to justify their existence. Well the the other point that I, well I did understand purely and simply because I'd come across a competent lawyer who blogs, who explained it, and um, his, his point was that the European Court of Human Rights lets nobody out of jail. That's it true. simply issues compensation. So in fact, the Supreme Court is doing not the job of the European Court of Human Rights because it is actually releasing prisoners. Although again, that's murky because the Scots guy hasn't been released. Being, they've decided, almost certainly they've decided that they're going to retry him. Which 
brings you to the economic point that Alex Salmon made about just how much money all this costs. Now, I can well understand the reasoning behind having that intermediary at UK level, because you, you wait three, four, five years to get to the European court, and this seems to be getting done in months rather than years. Well, that what is, I don't understand that's an is unionist argument. why can't we have in Scotland as part of our judiciary a, a, supreme. a supreme court? Exactly. Why does it have to be a UK Supreme Court well, why did, but why, when they're two different systems? But, but why does there have to be a difference? If we're supposed to be a partnership of equals, how come the English courts are not equal to the Scottish courts? Well, that I mean, that was the surprise to me. I didn't realise that the um, Supreme Court could basically take a case from prison. I didn't realise it, it, it missed out the step of our appeal court passing it on, which is very presumptive. In fact, you know, I'm, I was kind of on the fence about all this. Mm. But look, there is a, there's another enormous issue which we haven't touched on today, but which concerns me quite a lot. I'll be the devil's advocate. I'll just bring up Lockerbie, for example. And there is a very strong case for saying that Scottish justice has failed us. There's, there's no question of it. Um, Gareth Pierce. Oh, there's my lace of teeth again. Gareth Pierce, who's a, a London lawyer, who stands up. She has been involved in the Birmingham Six, the Guildford Four, some clear miscarriages of justice, major cases right through across the years. She's turned her attention again, not for the first time, to the Lockerbie, the Lockerbie case and, and the argument that McGrathy was falsely convicted. And this is just an example of how the Scottish legal system establishment is in denial, not just of that issue but other issues and unfortunately it's become a kind of argument for those who are in favour of the existing situation with the UK Supreme Court. In other words, Scottish judiciary is not up to standard. Well I, I have no problem with the UK Supreme Court but I do believe that it should be Scottish judges that make decisions on Scottish cases. Now if you, I mean, if you want to have a UK Supreme Court where you've got two different legal systems, by all means have it. But have people who are trained in each legal system dealing with that system. Right, but look, and is... allow the Scottish system to send case to the UK Supreme Court. Now, right. Sam, Salmon's argument, all right, or the SNP argument, about how you deal with it is right. I mean, the, there should be that layer where our our Scottish Supreme Court, our Court of Appeal says, look, we've reviewed this, there is room for doubt, although our decision has been, we believe you should look at the human rights aspect of it, on you go. And the Lockerbie case well, would point, never get there. Well, look, this is my point. Um, it is being used as an argument by some lawyers in particular. There is a, a blog, The Firm Online, which is a legal blog, and um, some quite important people write on it. And uh, they are pressing this case that there is a, a need for a review of the establishment's denial of certain miscarriages in the Scottish system. However, that is not, from where I'm sitting, is not a valid reason to pass that off to a UK court. The Scottish legal system profession really needs to look at itself. Yeah, it's a reason for us to put our house in order. Except not to pass it on to London to sort out our problems. I mean, is it? are we then saying that the, the establishment, the legal establishment in Scotland is not prepared to look at itself critically? Yes, I'm suggesting that's the case and have been saying so for quite some time. So the solution to it is for Holyrood to set up a review with independent judges. Well, and I, I would suggest that what you do is you look to Europe. Yeah. Well, the, the whole question, I think, the, the, that the, panel. the Lockerbie, case, the Lockerbie McGrathy case is the big one. The big one that, that, that displays the, the problem with um, the Scottish that, I mean, legal system. I mean, it's not the only one. It's the McGrathy 
Lockerbie thing is an example for so many things. I mean, that, you, you could use it as an example. Well, can I just bring, let me just make a couple of points, because I, I, if I haven't pointed you um, to read Gareth Pierce's most recent article on the subject, which is, it came out only in the last seven days, the, it's, that McGrady case was based entirely on forensic evidence. Yeah? Did you know that the, the same forensic scientist that was found to have failed in the cases of the Guildford and the Birmingham Six was used <laughs> for the lock. He, he was retired. You know, retired being a, a verb. <laughs> Some long time ago, and yet they pulled him out and he, his evidence was accepted even though he had already been proved to be a, a doubtful scientist. The, the he was used thing, in the Lockerbie being McGrathy thing. But the whole thing smacks, I'm sorry, of American pressure to me. It's about somebody has to be punished for this. And Gaddafi... I mean, I remember thinking at the time, McGrathy's the fall guy. You know? Of course he was. And you, you could almost hear the meeting. You're going to take the fall for this. We'll look after your family. <laughs> you know, sort of mafia thing going on. Well, there would be no choice. Because if he didn't take the fall for it, Based he would family disappear. Would, yeah. But this way around, he, get, he simply stays, goes to jail instead of dying and his family gets looked after. You can see, no choice. Yes, I can see that. I mean, it always did smack of that. And... I mean, a conspiracy like that must have involved so many people for one person to end up with no link to anybody else doing time for it. It's always been uncomfortable in, well, look, in it my is, mind. It's something that we, I would like to return to. Um, and you know, I'd like to be able to say we've got the freedom to, and the time to focus on it. Uh, I think it was, as I say, it was Gareth Pierce's article last week that really brought it, highlighted it. But it... It underpins the idea that Scotland is too poor, too wee and too stupid to run its own affairs. And unfortunately, the, McGra the Lockerbie McGrathy case looks as though our legal establishment is too stupid or too corrupt to examine its own shortcomings. And that's why this UK Supreme Court issue, as it, the temperatures raised, is watch out, watch this space. There's a lot more to happen. As as a general, general, genuinity, in general, <laughs> do you do you still have that kind of euphoric feeling that I think a lot of people had after the election about the direction we seem to be taking a much more socially aware society, going back hundreds of years to the time when we invented banks with integrity. A legal system with integrity. No, so I wouldn't go as far as that, but I would, I would, I would subscribe to the, the expression, a Scottish Spring, which has been attacked by some, but I would subscribe to that, that there is a debate, a mature debate about democracy, about sovereignty, about what independence means in, the, in this modern world, uh, and that has been accelerated as a result of the, the, the recent Scottish election. I think that's true. What, what I find found quite strange, I mean, Ian Gray said something today to um, FMQs about people were not talking about the legal wrangle that's going on at the moment. The Supreme Court row. Um, and yet that's what they are talking about. I mean, I work behind a bar in the middle of Leith and... It's not a bunch of intellectuals. Well, some of them are. They're, they're not stupid, but it's a fair mix of people, and they talk about that. They don't talk about care homes. That might be a, general, a generational thing because they're not of an age where it affects them. But that's what they're talking about. They're t and they're talking about independence. Um, one very good English friend of ours has the quandary where his kids are Scots. The man, Phil Oh, aye. Um, and he's quite, he, he's really quite venomous about, you know, he doesn't want it to happen. He sees it as dividing his family. And that really surprised me because, you know, this idea of border controls and passports and so on is just so much nonsense. Sort of nonsense. But that, that argument is still strong. It's well embedded in, in the unionist camp. 
Um, but the union is somehow talking about it, which was something they never did. They just poo-pooed it and it's, it'll never happen. But it's got so to it's be on the agenda. But it's, and the big questions are on the agenda. Well, again, the point is this, that it's time... I, when I refer to what, I'm, what I call the Scottish Spring, this debate, it, 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 writers have been, and, and commentators have been going on about this for well over, a, probably about a year, in, in Scotland and on um, forums like Open Democracy or uh, Our Kingdom. You can look these websites up. Serious writers um, can contribute there. But the point is, well, I'm looking at this. I'm looking at, for example, this map of um, the United Kingdom's really exclusive ex economic zone. And it's a question of perception. <coughs> and there you have, on this map, there's Scotland and there's our exclusive economic zone, which is apparently about three times the size of the English economic zone. Uh, there are different perceptions, you know, the English regard themselves as, yes, they are 90% of the population of these islands, but they don't have the natural resources that Scotland has. It's, I'm not, I'm not even sure that this is an argument that, that brings our case forward, if you like, for independence, because it's scary. What do you mean, the, the to, reaction from England? Yeah, it worries me considerably that uh, we, that there should be the possibility of any the temperatures could be raised to the point where there could be violence. That's what worries me. Well, that I mean, I I would rather stay part of the union than see bombs, letter bombs, be sent to Westminster. I and I hope the vast majority of people feel the same way. But I see no advantage in that whatsoever. Uh, I'd be interested actually to know statistically what the makeup of Scots in the British Army are. <laughs> Do you think we might need to bring them home to defend the borders? Uh, well, I doubt. The problem is, it wouldn't be a border to defend. It would be an internal. Mm. It yes. would be I, I, it would more be like island, yeah. uh, and that's what. And of course, people. There are people that would um, that, would like to see that. That was interesting today. That it was Annabel Goldie and Willie Rennie who brought up the constitutional question. You know, you, I had the impression that they had to be chat to each other beforehand. Um, Annabel Goldie brought it up was fairly aggressive for Annabel Goldie. I mean, normally her and Salmon seem to be able to hit off each other quite comfortably, but she wasn't mucking about today. Well, that kind of refers back to what I said about John Swinney. John Swinney winding up the energy debate, which was immediately before First Minister's questions, had pointed out that the, the the Tories had been very aggressive and negative about renewables and the uh, SME government motion about um, the future of energy in Scotland, whereas uh, the Lib Dems and the Labour Party had been fairly um, supportive. Well, they're going to have to watch themselves because they've got fairly high up Tory members busy leasing off chunks of the countryside that they own um, for millions in rent. Millions. Uh, so it seems to be a case of don't do as I do, do as I say. It, it'll be interesting. I, fi I, found it, I found a different atmosphere mostly because of Ian Gray's attitude. Um, it's almost as if they, they want to appear to be part of a Scottish movement without having to commit to it. I think maybe somebody has realised somewhere that the people of Scotland are looking for a government that thinks about Scotland, not Westminster. I don't, I, it's, you know, I'm quite happy to broaden it out and simply summarise it in this way, that uh, the Labour Party, even south of the border, has been largely, compared to the Tories, neutral about Europe. Whereas the rhetoric for the last 30 years from the Tories has been so anti-Europe that they just can't, they don't recognise that this is actually a global movement. It's not just something that's happening in Europe. The loss of sovereignty is something that we've all lost across the planet. Um, there is a, a, a Scottish dimension to that. I think I, it's, it's interesting. I always thought that Salmon's stance on it was a way to placate 
the unionists. Because his argument was always really, right, okay, we're leaving the UK union, but we are remaining part of the bigger union of Europe and of the bigger part of a global union. Complicated in some ways to get across. It's less so now, because ever since the <coughs> big you know, economic crisis of 2008, I think it's sunk into just about everybody, without, even if you're not particularly, even if you don't read the, the broadsheets, that how interdependent the world is. 